Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third video uh, for our third section of our ecology unit. Uh, the first two, we discussed biogeochemical cycles. We discussed how we have energy flowing through our ecosystems and food webs and food chains. And this one, we're going to be looking at how organisms can specifically interact with each other and how the ecosystem can change over time and how all of this is kind of interconnected and can affect all the different components throughout an ecosystem. So we need to kind of start with looking at this picture here and we can see a ton of different things going on here. We see a hawk carrying a little bird in its talons. We see a fisherman fishing. There's a little turtle guy on that log doing turtley things. All of these are great examples of a living, living interaction, biotic, biotic. But this pond here, it's probably going to look different in the wintertime. It might be frozen over. So temperature and water are going to come into play and change this ecosystem, depending on the time of year. And if the ecosystem changes, all of these behaviors in turn are going to change. So we can start to see how abiotic and biotic interactions and biotic and biotic interactions really do change from day to day and even year to year, depending what's going on in the ecosystem. We looked at all of these different words. These are our levels of organization that we care about for our ecology unit and our earth systems class here. We have the organism or an individual population community, ecosystem, which was our big important one, and then biome. Remember ecosystem, that's the smallest level of organization, the first, smallest level of organization, I should say, where we have this interaction of living and non-living things, biotic and abiotic things in environment. So all of our discussion is really gonna focus in at the ecosystem level, how all these things interact with each other. So let's think about the space in which these animals live in, its habitat. The behaviors and the patterns that we can see that start cropping up really have to do with how that habitat is set up, how it's established. Is there enough food for organisms? Is there enough water? Do they have shelter to protect themselves if they need to? If you look at the pictures on the right, we have a school of fish. This is a behavior that they show when they're trying to protect themselves. In the open water, they have to deal with predators too. Swordfish are very aggressive, very fast moving fish that work in groups to try to attack these schools of fish for food. And while these fish are not nearly as fast as swordfish, they use this kind of group mentality to protect themselves. Same thing with the elephants, the herd elephants there. Even though elephants are really big organisms, they're gonna work in groups to protect themselves to make sure you know they're safe from anything that wants to try to predate on top of them and hunt them down. Time of the year is big when we're looking for different patterns and behaviors that we see from different organisms. The population sizes will definitely change depending on the seasons. It is almost October, and we're going to start seeing those Canadian geese flying over. Monarch butterflies are one of the largest migratory animals in the world. I think this year alone, there's probably upwards of half a billion monarch butterflies that want to migrate from Canada down to Mexico, and then back later on in the spring when temperatures rebound. So the population sizes are going to change with the seasons as well. So how the habitat is established, the time of year, those factor into different organism behaviors. We can also begin looking at different types of relationships. Predator prey is a huge one. Not only do the number of predator and prey affect each other, but the location affects it. How they respond to each other in that environment is going to affect the distribution of both of these types of creatures. If I am a fox and I see my food over there, my little rabbit that I'm going to hunt down, and I see the rabbit running away, I'm not gonna stand still. I'm gonna chase after the rabbit because I need that food source. Conversely, if I'm the rabbit and I see a fox coming at me, I'm not gonna stand still. I'm gonna run away from it. The prey is going to run, the predators are going to chase. So each of these distributions of organisms is gonna be codependent on what the other organism is going to do do. Those population numbers are going to affect each other. Their behaviors are going to affect each other. That's predator prey in a nutshell. We did the gizmo lab where we spoke about and investigated what happens with that wolf and deer population in that fictional park that was mocked after the events that happened in Yellowstone National Park. That's a predator prey relationship and a really good example of that. 
The next type of relationship we need to look at is competition and cooperation, how organisms can cooperate and compete and depend on each other for survival, depending the situation. Competition, we can look at as organisms competing against other organisms for food and even competing against organisms of the same species for food. This image here is our little reindeer elk. They obviously live in some sort of polar region. It's not very green, not a lot of producers, probably not a lot of food. So if they come across a food source, even though they're the same species, they will fight over that food source. And then if they come across, let's say a polar bear, and it's the polar bear versus the elk versus the food source, there's gonna be a giant fight for that food source depending these species. We can see that really well in scavenger species like hyenas and vultures. These hyenas, they're gonna compete against the vultures for that food, but then hyena one and hyena two, they're gonna fight over the food as well. When we think competition, we can't exclude plants. Plants compete for sunlight and nutrients as well. Plants are gonna to grow towards sun and they're gonna use as much nutrients in the soil that's available to survive. In our spot in Pennsylvania, you don't see this too much because the woods aren't super heavily dense compared to let's say the Amazon rainforest. But if you look at the Amazon rainforest, you can see these massive trees and these highly developed canopies at the top. Plants near the bottom, they've had to evolve over time to be able to survive with minimal sunlight. So depending where you are in the world, the competition could look very different compared to other places. Cooperation, that's kind of the other side of the coin, where we have this hive mentality, where organisms of the same species are all working toward the same goal. This is like a team sport, like soccer or volleyball or field hockey or water polo or football where you have people on the same team, each of them with maybe a different role on the team, but their end game is the same. So this example where we're looking at this picture of the beehive here, you might have some worker bees and some scouts and some drones and the queen and some soldier bees, but they're all working toward the survival of the hive. They're working toward that common goal. They're cooperating with each other as opposed to competing against each other. Next, we can even have relationships between organisms of completely different species, and we call that symbiosis. There are three main types of symbiosis we're going to care about for our class purposes. There is a few more. If you go on Google and you search symbiosis, you'll find some beyond what we're going to talk about here. But the ones we care about are relationships where either both species benefit, one benefits, while the other one is pretty much left alone and not affected, and then one where one species benefits while actually harming the second species. So the big difference with symbiosis is that it has to involve two different species to be even considered symbiotic. The first one that we look at is called mutualism. This is where you have two species interacting with each other where both benefit from the situation. Bees and flowers are like the key example of this. Honeybees and flowers. Honeybees, you know, they help with pollination, but what really is pollination? Bees are taking the pollen from one flower and taking it maybe, maybe to a completely different flower. That allows for cross-pollination and it helps flowers to reproduce. If we didn't have that type of pollination occurring, we would have much, much fewer different types of flowers globally. And that wouldn't be really good for the biological strength of flowers. If a disease came along and targeted flowers, and they're all the same one or two types of flowers, most of them might get wiped out. So cross-pollination is really important to really allow for this distribution of different types of characteristics between flowers so it increases their ability to survive in the environment. Additionally, bees take that pollen back to their hives in order to make honey, food for the hive. So this is a situation where both species benefit from this relationship. Commensalism, or what I like to refer to as my one-way street, this is where you have two species interacting, one benefits and the other is pretty much left alone. Here in this picture, we see a giant jellyfish and some little feeder fish sitting around it. 
Maybe an unfortunate organism gets stuck in the jellyfish's tentacles. It gets envenomated through nematocysts on the tentacles of the jellyfish, becomes paralyzed, and it doesn't make it. These little feeder fish, they then have food. They're like, yay, I can eat now. But these little fish, they're not doing anything for that jellyfish. The jellyfish is like, yeah, okay, you can have some scraps, but uh, whatever, you're not going to bother me. Go ahead. So these little feeder fish depend on the jellyfish for that purpose, but the jellyfish, they're like, yeah, whatever. So this is the one-way street. This is the one-sided relationship where one organism benefits, the other one doesn't. The last type of symbiotic relationship we're going to look at is parasitism, parasites. Two species interact with each other, one benefits, while the host species is actually harmed. There are several different types of parasites that range from microscopic ones to much larger ones like, uh, like deer ticks or fleas on dogs and cats or vampire bats, things like that. These are images of different types of human parasites that we see on the slide here. Number four, I'm pretty sure, is tapeworms that you can get from eating undercooked meats or meats that are about to spoil and things of that nature. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you cook your food thoroughly before ingesting it. But the big takeaway from this is it's any organism where one benefits, that's the parasite, and then the host species is being harmed. So, hey, this is why it's really important, especially here in the Northeast, to look for ticks after you've been outside and hiking in the woods, maybe, or walking your pets and animals. Tick season's really bad up here, and we got to watch out for Lyme disease. All of these different factors from relationships to predator prey, competition, cooperation, the time of year, and the establishment of the habitats, all of them work together to kind of look at this idea of population growth and birth and death rates within different uh, animals in the ecosystem. At a certain point in an ecosystem, populations might begin to grow out of control. In our lab, in our gizmo lab, when we looked at the wolves and the deer, when we removed the wolves, the deer began growing really, really rapidly out of control, doing a lot of negative things to the environment, eating all the producers. At some point, the environment will say that's enough and start having these different types of limiting factors come into play to bring back down the population of whatever animal species is growing out of control. They're limiting the growth of that species. We call them limiting factors. Any condition that limits the growth of a population and ecosystem. On the right here, we see many examples. If you have too many population of one species, they're gonna run out of a food source. They might start starving. Maybe you'll have an increase in diseases and parasites. If I am a, a deer and I'm eating all the plants in an area, that's reducing some natural barrier to flooding, perhaps. We could have increased natural disasters happening and a slew of other effects. So these limiting factors come into play to help reduce the population and keep it under what we call carrying capacity. This is the maximum number of individuals that an ecosystem is able to support. Once you get close to carrying capacity, you'll start seeing these limiting factors slowly start creeping up. Once you shoot past carrying capacity, that's when these limiting factors will really start coming into play. Because ecosystems, they need to bring down these out of control populations before it causes a total ecosystem collapse. And that's a bad thing. If that ecosystem collapses, nothing can live there. Nothing can survive there very long. So that's why we really have to pay attention to what is the carrying capacity of these species? What factors are limiting the growth? And this is a good thing. We want to make sure that you have these factors coming into play. The last thing we need to talk about now that we've kind of established the behaviors of the organisms, we're going to look at the ecosystem as a whole and how it can change over time depending what type of disturbances occur. And we call this change succession. It's the gradual change in an ecosystem where one community could be replaced by another. And we break it up into two sections. We start with primary succession. This is the first establishment of an ecosystem in an area. It has to start on an area of bare rocks that we see to the far left there. But we need to be able to go from rocks to being able to grow stuff. And in order to do that, we need soil. 
And in, oil, in order to get soil, we have to break the rock down through erosion. We have wind, rain, chemical processes that really help break down rocks. After a certain point of the rocks being exposed, you might get some mosses and some lichens growing on the rocks, which help accelerate this process. Starts breaking down the rocks, we start getting soil. We get enough soil where grasses and flowers start to be able to kind of slowly start growing. These first few plant species, we call pioneer species. They're the first species in our ecosystem. Even though they're just very little, they count. They count as a species. They're our first ones in our ecosystem now. Over more time, that soil gets deeper, more variety of plants start forming, like different types of grasses and perennials. Once we start seeing shrubs and some like very juvenile trees beginning to form, that's how we know we've kind of graduated into the intermediate step. That continues, the erosion grows, we get more soil until we hit what's called a climax community. Climax is kind of what we have outside here at the high school, where we have these really tall shade bearing trees, our food webs are very flushed out and intertwined. We have a very strong established community. If you look at the white bar at the bottom, you'll see this takes a long time, hundreds of years to occur. This is a very slow working process. But once I get to the climax community, I kind of just wait. I'm not finished because there's a lot of things going on at the micro level. But large disturbances can occur, like wildfires, like we see out in California and Australia. This is what's called secondary succession. You have a major disturbance. It gets rid of everything in our ecosystem, except for the soil. Forest fires are a great example of this because they're so prevalent. Everything's destroyed. The soil remains. We don't have to worry about going through erosion because we already have the soil, so we can just start repopulating with the different types of plant species. Our pioneer species were turned first, our grasses, our flowers, followed by our intermediate, our shrubs, our bushes, our small trees, until we work all the way back to the climax community. You see at the bottom, it takes somewhere of upwards of 150 years or more to re-reach that climax community. Out in California, where we have annual wildfires, unfortunately, there are places where we might not ever get back to the climax community because perhaps maybe two, three, four, five years pass and I'm just maybe starting to get into that intermediate step again. A wildfire happens, takes me all the way back to the beginning of secondary succession and I have to work back through this process again. So some might be able to get back to climax over a long enough period of time but some might just be stuck in this constant cycle of regrowth, fire, regrowth, fire. And then to make things even more interesting with our ecosystems, if you happen to be in a location in the world, let's say you have a volcano nearby and a volcano erupts, lava flows out of the volcano down the mountainside, that lava cools into rock, we can go back to primary succession and start this entire process over again. Glacier activity does that too. Let's say I'm in secondary. I'm in a climax community, but then glaciers, they extend past me and then they slowly retreat past. They act like a giant shovel, getting rid of everything except for the bare rock and ground. So lava flows from volcanoes, glacier movement, they're huge players when it comes to talking about succession. How do I know which one I'm in? Look to see what you're starting with. If I'm starting with an area of bare rocks, I'm in primary succession. If I'm starting with soil that's already established, I'm gonna begin with secondary succession. So in summary, from all of these slides, we have groups of living things interacting with each other in our ecosystems. They have different behaviors that we can see depending on how the habitat is established, depending on the time of year that we're dealing with. We have different relationships like predator prey. Organisms can cooperate. They can compete against each other for food. We have different types of relationships. We have symbiotic relationships like mutualism, commensalism, parasitism. And then one of the big main points you really want to take away is the last bullet point on the slide. 
that ecosystems are always in a state of change. They're always changing. They're never really truly finished because something is always going on that's adjusting things at either a big totalitarian level of the environment or maybe in little tiny micro sections of the environment, some things are changing. So this was our interactions and changes over time slides. If anybody has any questions, please reach out, please let me know. And I will see you all again next time. Bye-bye.